Over the last few weeks, while we have all been quarantined indoors, my thoughts have turned to the nature of architecture itself. I've come to wonder about the psychological effects of everyday habits that we are now confined to. Are the designs of windows, walls, and doors rearranging the inner architecture of our mind as we grow increasingly adapted to them? Is there something within the design of architecture itself that might reorganize our DNA if we find ourselves forced to prolonged exposure to it? Like uh, living on top of a radioactive mineral deposit that slowly mutates our cells, the nature of whatever architecture we find ourselves in will taint our minds and forever imprint itself on our future. This has led me to wonder about the purely psychological space taken up by places and things and the personal and fantastical attributes they might acquire in the purely conceptual headspace and experience of memory. As uh, someone living in New York, my first association with the architecture of the mind is a nostalgic, dreamlike imagining of Frederick Thompson's Luna Park, uh, as it would have been in 1903, glowing and chaotic in restless motion. As Rem Kohlhaas wrote of Luna Park in his book, Delirious New York, quote, Thompson's genius is to let these needles proliferate at random to create an architectural space out of the drama of their frenzied scramble for individuality and to identify this battle of the spires as the definitive sign of otherworldliness to mark uh, a mark of, other, of another condition. Luna Park is the epitome of modern magic and architecture, form freed from any function other than to stimulate the senses and spark the imagination. Luna Park, though a, a real place, is an emblem of the mind, a uniquely post-Victorian utopia where anything is possible. There is a feeling of limitless progress in its vision of an electric light studded lunar surface. It is interesting to consider that the same year of its construction, 1903, was also the year of the Wright brothers' first flight. It is as if the lunar landing was already in the cards before we had barely left the ground. So I compare this ghost-like vision to the work of Lebius Woods. You know, if Luna Park is an example of a post-Victorian utopia, the conceptual architecture of Lebius Woods is more like a Cold War dystopia. Not a trained architect, Woods turned from painting to design in 1976, seeking to imagine architectural projects that were never meant for realization. The concept drawings and models for Woods's structures are more like exercises in thought than actual proposals for real world developments. It's more like, and using this image that you're looking at here as an example, it's more like Libius Woods is thinking, what would happen if we had to work within the confines of a society where we had a high level of scarcity, for example, of certain materials? How would we work in a post-apocalyptic setting or post-war setting? An image like this I find very interesting because you can see uh, a more vernacular architecture, something that looks like a uh, uh, office building or a tenement building, and parts of it have been destroyed, maybe by a natural disaster. And then we have these um, mechanical, almost like leger, like um, futurist uh, pieces of sheet metal and wiring that are acting almost like a kind of, uh, almost like they're cauterizing the wound inside of that building. They've kind of repaired the, they've stitched together the surface of where this building has collapsed. Woods was interested in how architecture might adapt to radical circumstances, whether they were 
uh, a dystopian circumstance or otherwise. These could also easily be utopian situations that we're looking at. He was also interested in architects working within the conventions of style, um, but he was actually more interested in uh, artists or architects who are untrained, you could say self-taught like himself, and how they might conceptualize architecture or react to architecture. He felt that self-taught designers would respond in a more organic way. So not only when we are looking at conceptual models like the one you're looking at here by Woods, uh, when you're looking at pieces like this, it's not only um, that you're looking at a piece in a uh, constructed in a situation where you have a lack of resources or a lack of certain building conventions, but you're also looking at a situation where the architects themselves might have to improvise or they might have to work in ways that are unfamiliar to them. Uh, maybe they have no prior architectural training or engineering skills. And so they are improvising and adapting to uh, a new set of circumstances. The designs by Woods that I find most interesting, though, are the slightly sinister barnacles of metal that seem to grow onto uh, more vernacular architecture, like homes and office buildings. These suggest a time that might be in our future, but could easily be in our present when building materials may have been sourced from whatever is at hand and such luxuries as history, order, and aesthetics may have to be abandoned. Just as Levius Woods finds new imaginary potential in approaching architecture from the untrained perspective, I can get a glimpse of what impossible architecture might mean in the works of self-taught artists, specifically self-taught artists working within uh, architecture. The ideal palace of Ferdinand Chaval, built over the course of 33 years and completed in 1912, is an extraordinary work of naive architecture. This structure is built of large uh, river-washed stones, pebbles, concrete, fossils, and it resembles the temples of Angkor Wat, with some of the towers uh, of Cheval's palace reaching as much as 42 feet high. So a very extraordinary work uh, that he had constructed over many years. The inspiration for this structure came to Cheval, who was a postman by profession, after he stumbled over an oddly shaped stone, and then afterwards, he had a dream of constructing this architectural project the following night. Cheval writes, quote, I was walking very fast when my foot caught on something and that sent me stumbling a few meters away. I wanted to know the cause, end of quote. So he had stumbled over this stone and he had looked down and it was this odd, almost alien form to him. Cheval also writes, quote, in a dream, I had built a palace, a castle, or caves, end of quote. So Cheval, as well, uh, has also had a dream afterwards. And in this dream, he sees himself constructing something, but even he can't determine whether the thing that he is building is something man-made or whether it is something natural. There's a blurring of the line between what is natural, what is dream, what is designed by intention. Uh, there's almost a, a severing of intention that Cheval does by making these statements. Andre Breton, the founder of the Surrealist movement, of course, dubbed Cheval, quote, the uncontested master of mediumistic architecture and sculpture, unquote. Uh, though not specifically a mediumistic artist, in the sense of claiming a spirit had guided him to create. He wasn't a channeler. He wasn't performing seances. He was not a spiritualist necessarily. But Cheval, um, he does give credit to forces that are outside of him, that are something extra outside of the artist himself. Um, he doesn't claim that a spirit had guided him, 
but in his own words, he does give credit to the random associative alchemy of the mind and the premonitory power of dreams. Mediums are not necessarily capable of identifying the forces that work through them. Uh, a medium, to say a work is mediumistic, does not necessarily indicate that there is a particular spirit or entity or God working through the artist. It could be something like, uh, it could be something elemental, like forces in nature as well. This is the stone that inspired Cheval. In the swirling patterns of the, the sediment here, we see the implications of Cheval's organic, self-generating, intuitive forms. The art of the impossible is somewhere between what is and what is not yet. In this stone, this stone here, Cheval glimpsed the not yet inside the what is. He looked into something that he was confronted with, that confronted him with something really alien to himself, and he recognized a potential that had not yet been realized. The extraordinary nature of architecture that is fantastical or impossible is here already in our world, in the forms of nature. We need to re-see nature. We need to recognize it in order to uh, find this potential. Uh, we need to re-remember what is extraordinary about it. The Sagrada Familia, a cathedral in Barcelona, Spain, designed by the visionary architect Antony Gaudi, bears some similarities to the ideal palace. Like Cheval's towers, the Sagrada Familia uh, is an ever-changing structure in its nature, both within, both within the interior, which you see on your right-hand side, and in the exterior, in the facade, which you see on your left-hand side. No single form in the Sagrada Familia is homogeneous. Uh, a fluted column becomes the head of a lotus flower. A cavernous facade, like the paper interior of a wasp's nest, gives way to forms that look like sand dunes or um, anthills and melting stone adorned with classical ornament. Gaudi is hinting at the endless potential of transformation in nature. He's hinting at the not yet. Impossible architecture and fantastical forms, um, within them there is something that can never be realized. They can be brought into existence, but they will still always hint at something endless, something uh, bottomless, a bottomless abyss, and an endlessly unrealized potential. The wonder surrounding architecture and the dream of realizing an impossible architecture may have its origins at the very beginning of civilization. The ruins of the past, which would symbolize many things for the artists of the neoclassical and romantic styles of the 18th and 19th century, have always emitted a certain aura of awe and mystery. One of the oldest maps known from the 6th century BCE, from the Neo-Babylonian period, shows a map of the world rendered on a clay tablet. It describes lands of serpents, dragons, scorpion men, a far northern region where the sun is never seen, and a great body of water they call the Bitter River. The map also describes ruined cities that are watched over by ruined gods. This is perhaps a cryptic reference to the falling glory of Sumerian cities such as Ur, Uruk, and Nineveh. Stonehenge, the well-known Neolithic structure, still has this presence of mystery in our imagination today. 
its exact purpose is not fully understood, even though there are many speculations about it having astrological functions or having burial or ritual functions. Its builders are not exactly known. Um, and the exact methods of its construction, even though there's a lot of speculation about it, still remains, most, for the most part, a mystery. The oldest depiction of Stonehenge, which you see here, comes from the 14th century manuscript by the poet Robert Wace. And this depiction shows the Arthurian magician Merlin directing two giants to construct the large stone circle. Traces of the mystery such megaliths as Stonehenge leave in their wake can be found in the work of self-taught builder Edward Leedskallion, a Latvian American who settled in Florida in 1920. Leedskallion's life's work culminated in the Oolite limestone structure known as Coral Castle, made entirely of stone, shaped and formed using techniques that remain a mystery to this day. The Coral Castle contains a two-story castle tower that served as Leedskallen's living quarters and an accurate sundial, as well as a telescope an obelisk, a barbecue, a water well, a fountain, celestial stars and planets, numerous pieces of furniture, including a heart-shaped table, a table in the shape of Florida, 25 rocking chairs, chairs resembling crescent moons, a bathtub, beds, and a throne. For all its mystery, Coral Castle evokes the same sense of play in the exotic that we see in the original design of Luna Park. Lead Scallion's Coral Castle is a whimsical work of art, but at the heart of playful, childlike design is a core of yearning for the marvelous, for magic and play. The marvelous, because it is novel, almost always has a subversive potential something which was recognized by early radical modern artists, such as the Surrealists or the Dada group. Psychogeography, a practice which has its roots in the letterist and situationist international movements, as well as Marxist and anarchist theory, is an exploration of environments that emphasize playfulness and drifting it is the flaneur doing what the flaneur does, being one with the spectacle and the unexpected in movement. Situationist theorist Guy Debord wrote of psychogeography in 1955 as the quote, study of the precise laws and specific effects of psychogeographical environments, consciously organized or not, on the emotions and behavior of individuals, end of quote. If the architecture of the impossible is to exist at all, it can only be arrived at through the playfulness of drifting in and out of possibility. This video itself, as it moves from one association to the next, can be viewed as a psychogeography in form. As I move from addressing architecture that is to architecture that might soon be, the conclusion is not as significant as the associative connections made along the way. Psychogeography can be applied to the work of Frederick Kiesler, specifically to his project titled The Endless House. Kiesler, an Austrian-American artist, designer, and theoretician, was influenced early on by the Distill group in the 1920s and later became associated with the Surrealist and Dada circles. Between 1950 and 1960, Kiesler worked on the Endless House 
a work of conceptual architecture which was never fully realized beyond a small-scale model built in 1959, which you see here. Numerous drawings, design plans, and written materials were also produced. Endless House was conceived as an expression of Kiesler's personal metaphysics. Kiesler believed that reality was made up of more than simply matter. He viewed matter as static and only a single expression of reality, which was in truth much more multifaceted. To Kiesler, the interaction of forces between the three environments, the human environment, the natural environment, and the technological environment was not static and continual. The Endless House embodied values of Kiesler's own invention, co-reality and biotechnique, two terms that Kiesler had invented. Co-reality or co-realism was imagined by him as the scientific exploration of the dynamic relationships between humanity, nature, and technology. These were not only environments to Kiesler, but also parallel realities that existed as separate worlds, remote in their inner logic, but deep in the effect they had on one another. Biotechnique, as Kiesler defined it, is the human manifestation of biotechnics or the building mechanisms of nature. The division between the two is continuity. Nature can create through cell division and therefore it can create infinitely. Humans can only design and build by joining together pre-existing materials. We are limited by not being the source of our own architectural matter. I wonder if Kiesler would have been pleased if the human body had somehow been equipped with some organic extrusion like spider silk, which we could weave into our own cocoon-like homes. The plans for the Endless House represent a utopian proposal that was for reconstructing our architectural environment to be in a greater accord with nature and also the invisible mystical structure underlying the universe as Kiesler saw it. The house is endless because it was intended to be made with one seamless continuous primary structure of reinforced concrete. It is also endless because it lacks any particular orientation or rest. It is a house of no direction, in other words, and no moment of pause. It also is a house where the walls blend into each other, where rooms exit into themselves, the windows become the doors and become the stairs, and the ceilings become the floors in one unified, shared materiality. This is the home as labyrinthine cave structure or as rhizome. Kiesler was a surrealist, and as a surrealist, he was interested in the mind and the psychological healing of society in the wake of World War II. He was interested in the possibility of realizing an architectural concept that was healing and not just something to be uh, actualized in the material sense. This is where, for me, impossible architecture, utopian design, and the journey of the mind that we find in psychogeography 
meet with a mutual goal in the walls of the endless house. We are witness to the birth of a new age of stress, of new anxieties and new hopes, and hopes for the repair and the preparation of coming times. We see in the failure of governments, economies, and our own stewardship of the environment, possible flaws in our technological and philosophical progress up to this point. The Endless House takes us a step in the right direction. What artists can do is make proposals. They can dissect abstract ideas. They can test the validity of these dreams in the laboratories of the studio and the drafting table. The Endless House proposes a merger of spirit, environment, and design in some far off place in the future, but it never fully delivers that. It leaves the void, the place where the soon to be, the not yet, the impossible architecture exists. Impossible architecture is design as overreach. It seeks to steal all of the secrets of the universe and all of the possibilities of the future, but it never quite does that. It only succeeds by maybe launching us halfway there towards our goal. In the twists and turns of the seashell walls of the endless house, we are taken on a tour of the psychogeography of our future. The world we wander into is full of sublime ruins, ancient Atlantis, moon rock castles, and the interplanetary craft of a highly advanced race of alien ants. We turn down a hallway that curves like a nautilus shell and we find ourselves touching the facade of something like Gaudi's Sagrada Familia and the fossil encrusted temple walls of Ferdinand Cheval's ideal palace. The heart of impossible architecture is here and it is vital because it wants us to look forward towards greater futures to come. <laughs>